Welcome to Movie Friends. My name is Seth. I've been thinking a lot about nightmares lately. This is probably due to the fact that I've been having a lot of nightmares lately. Sometimes it's normal stuff, like a monster is coming towards me, and I know that if I say the right thing, it will just disappear, but I've suddenly lost the ability to speak. Sometimes it's that I've done something horrible, and no matter what I do to fix it, nothing gets better, only worse. It seems cruel and unnecessary that our brains do this to us. Why would it create these terrifying stories that don't feel like stories? Why wouldn't our brains just make nice, normal things? If I could make a dream, would I make a nice one? This episode is a conversation with Sam Fox. She's an actor, producer, and director with a talent for making nightmares. And we talk about genre, her body of work, and the horror movie that helped shape her brain at age five. I spent a lot of time leading up to this, diving into everything that she's had a hand in. And I really recommend you give it a look if you're a lover of horror, or if you have a deep appreciation for puns taken to their highest level. I really loved this conversation. Her chihuahua even joins in for a minute. And if you aren't familiar with her work, it's still worth your time to hear her experiences and be motivated to go out and make your own dreams or nightmares if you'd like. Here's my conversation with Sam. I hope you enjoy. So like I said, I, I watched everything. Like I, I watched Wowzers. Wow, okay. Yeah, so Wowzers, Unagi. I watched um, Pills. Oh my God, amazing. Yeah, I watched so you've Pills. You've seen the growth of Sam Fox. Yes, yeah. I, um, uh, there's something wrong with Mummy. And wow. the thing that really struck me through like all of it is the early stuff has very simple ideas, right? But the production value on all of them is like, oh, it almost like exceeds the the premise. You know what I mean? <laughs> like there's something wrong with mummy. Very, very simple, right? It's it's kind of like a one joke reveal thing. And, you know, you don't live in that reveal for too long before it ends. But it looks really good. Like it's shot really well. Like how much of that did you do? Like in those early in those oh early shorts? God. It's that's such a funny question. Um, well, I love a pun. So a lot okay. of my films, even fucking nuts are about puns. Um, yes. And I, I love that you picked up on the simple idea. I am a, a visual storyteller. I started yes. painting. That's I wanted to be a painter. But then I have a love for the movies. And I realized like, what am I going to be like just a, a painter? Like that's not sure. really a career. So that's when I, I tried to, you know, blend the two together. And so I was always very um, nervous and ashamed and self-conscious of my concepts and my ideas. And I would never ask anyone to help me because, like, I didn't want to subject them to, you know, my silliness. Sure. Yeah. So a lot of those early ones are like iPhone. It's me doing everything. So I was, I was the daughter. I was the mummy. I was the cameraman, the lighting person, the props. I think there was even a shot where I'm like simultaneously opening the door and like smoke comes up. Yeah. And the best story about that, there's a BTS of me in bed, like with the mummy wrap on. And of course I wrapped it myself. So it's falling apart and I'm trying to get this shot. And uh, my boyfriend at the time comes in and I'm making these like horrible (laughs) groaning noises. And he's like, Sam, he's like, you can't, you can't be doing this. He's like, the neighbors are going to call the cops. You got to stop. <laughs> and then like my dog comes up and like starts chewing on one of the wraps and I'm just like, fuck. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot easier having help and collaborating. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it seems like, uh, I, I notice a lot of the same names, um, throughout some of the, throughout some of the show, especially Candace, who I, I it, it would seem has a lot of input into the last two. Is that correct? I couldn't get her to come to New Orleans. She was getting married and starting a new production. So New Orleans is fucking nuts. And yeah, but she was with, she was with me on Unagi and um, Bad Acid and everything she touches is gold. She's a genius. And um, especially when it comes to like, 
art directing, styling, kind of everything. So yeah, when I was making fucking nuts and I found out she couldn't come and I got an equally as incredible production designer named Brooke H. Sellers, I went to her and I was like, okay, here's the pictures. The, the house was, it was completely bare. It was, wow. you know, there was nothing in there. It was kind of a house that's been used as like a storage unit. Um, And I'm all about colors and patterns and textures and the walls had nothing on them. I was just like, oh my God, what am I going to do? So I came to her and we kind of talked through some ideas of, you know, putting stuff all over the walls. And um, yeah, it's, it's nice to have her, even if she's not on set as a creative bat. Sure. On its board. Yeah. It, it all looks great. I watch a lot of short, short films and, um, I want to, let's see here. <laughs> okay. You won't offend me. Don't worry. Oh, well, it's no offense to you. It's actually like, you know, a little sycophantic, but <laughs> I watch a lot of short films and you can, you kind of have to like look for what's good in a lot of them where again, with your stuff, it always seems like the production is like really, really well done. Um, like very, very I mean, impressive. I was I was pretty impressed, you know, uh, especially with um, Bad Acid and Fucking Nuts. Both of them reminded me of two different things. Bad Acid reminded me a lot of something that I love, which is Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that series or not. No. Wow. OK, so that's that's pretty surprising. From what? Era. Probably about 10 years ago is two two creators in Britain. Um, they made a series of shorts. If you haven't checked them out yet, don't hug me. I'm scared. Fantastic. You got me at Britain. I'm, um, yeah. <laughs> I'm, half English. I'm half English. So like my humor, I don't really get American humor. Sure. So, um, and also like, you know, English people are just severely disturbed. And that is a compliment. Tr- try to watch them in order. If okay. I will definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. And then um, growing up in the 90s, and I had shared this with you a little bit over email, the latest one really reminded me of a mix between Are You Afraid of the Dark or Eerie Indiana or even like a little bit of Goosebumps. Goosebumps was way more cheesy. And it was cool because I could see certain influences and they're not necessarily your influences, but at the same time, it didn't feel like it was just copying something, you know, like we use Lynchian, right? It's like, Oh, well, that's so Lynchian. And all it means is that they're copying David Lynch, <laughs> <laughs> but this felt like it, it, it felt like it had its own unique thing. Uh, I, I'm thinking of when uh, the lead throws up on the porch <laughs> And the boyfriend just kind of <laughs> like slides it to the side with his hand and sits down and, and the scene just continues. There's a lot of very cool, interesting, unique things. And there's not really a question in what I just said, um, other than I was impressed. I, th- I think this stuff is great. Thank you so much. I mean, that means so much to me. I'll have to give the um, puke slide to the lead actor, Vince. That was <laughs> his idea. When we were coming up with the character, I was just like, You love her so much that nothing that happens matters. Yeah. Um, It's got to be that type of love. And so when we were talking about like, well, how, what does he do with the vomit? Because the vomit's where he's supposed to sit. It was just a, you know, Vince's creative decision. He's so committed that, you know, he comes up with stuff like that. And yeah, I, that, that comment um, and compliment means a lot to me because I've, I've really struggled throughout, you know, my life being an artist of, feeling like I never fit into a category. Um, So I thought like that I would, there wasn't really a place for me in the industry, whether when it was painting back in the day when I was painting, it was kind of similar. It was like surreal, very dark stuff to have, you know, the last few years have my films go to festivals that I find like reputable and incredible festivals with incredible talent. It's been incredibly validating and God, I mean, artists, we suffer a lot for our art and like, I'm finally starting to get that payoff of that's great. like finding yeah. people who like it it just gives me like um it, i've got goosebumps right now it means so much to me. <laughs> it's great living in the uh the age of the internet sometimes we can focus on the negatives because the negatives are so glaring right and they're so apparent but there's such positives to them too where you know someone like you can create something and 
if you keep at it, eventually you will find an audience. Like there are 7 billion plus people on this planet. Mm -hmm. And it turns out a lot of them are into the same things that we're into, you know? It was kind of crazy when I first went to like, I, you know, early on, I didn't really go to film festivals. And then the first few ones I did weren't genre. And when I started going to the genre film festivals, I'm like, oh my God, here is a group, like a large group of people that all are into the same, like sickly, funny, twisted, dark stuff that I'm into. <laughs> and like a lot of them are way weirder. And it, it was just cool. It was like finding, you know, my people because growing up in, you know, a suburb of Los Angeles, those people were few and far between. Right, right. So I, I'm curious, I know that you mentioned that you started out painting. What was film for you growing up? Like, when did that become something that interested you enough to learn how to do it and then like make movies? Because everyone says like, oh, I love movies, but there are people who love movies and then there are people who love movies. And so like, what, what yeah. was that for you? I give it to my mom for introducing me to Rosemary's Baby when I was five years old. Awesome. And I think what happened, I'm, I'm trying to like figure out what transpired because um, it was probably some form of trauma. But, um, you know, I think a lot of times when you, the kids watch these films that are made for children to be very easily digested and, um, you know, kind of hit all the right notes of child films. I, you know, they didn't, you know, I loved them, but I think that seeing something as shocking as Rosemary's Baby, like at such a young age, really had an impact and really informed. Like, I didn't know what was going on, but I knew that I loved Rosemary and I knew that this is so dark to say, but the psychedelic rape scene that happened, I was like, wow, there's like a monster and like all these colors. And I loved that. And then my sister, who's eight years older, was like a horror fanatic. She traumatized me a lot too. Sure. Um, she used to, there was certain films that like they had this one scene where it would get to that scene. And I'm like, young, I'm, you know, I'm maybe six. And I'm like, sissy, I can't watch this scene. Like, I'm going to leave the room and tell me when it's over. She would pause it right before the scene started and be like, come back in, Sam, it's over. And I somehow fell for it every single time. I think that's my good natured trust. Sure that I had in my dysfunctional family. And then, um, you know, it all kind of came together with, I grew up on a um, very secluded, like animal ranch up in the Malibu mountains. Oh, wow. Yeah. There was not like, my sister was eight years older. So she was kind of, she would hang out with me, but she was into her own things. My parents weren't really present. And so it was just kind of me and a bunch of animals and my imagination. And so I would just, you know, I was obsessed with Jurassic Park. So I would pretend to be Sam Neill in Jurassic Park and do the little bandana tied around my neck and you know, <laughs> go through, you know, the wilderness, just reenacting the film. I think, you know, the combination of all that at a very formative five and six years old was a very formative time in my life. Yeah. It kind of, it set me up to know that that's where I would end up one day. As far as painting, did you have any kind of training or schooling or was it just something that you like pursued on your own? Yeah, I think... It's yeah, because I don't really have artists in my immediate family, but my great grandfather and my great uncle, um, who were in England, were both famous artists. Um, one was a famous car, like automobile artist, and the other would do um, incredible drawings of like in religious books of religious scenes, like history books. Okay. So I didn't really have like artistic roots when growing up. I think what it was for me is I have difficult, I have a difficult time expressing myself with words which is another reason why my ideas are quite simple in my films. And so I found that I could, I, you know, I was a very, I was a very unhappy child. <laughs> and um, I found that using art was a way of letting out some of that darkness that was in me and a form of expression. And it was also just, you know, felt freeing. I had a high school art teacher, which she really liked my work. She thought it was really weird and she didn't understand it at all because she was into like, landscapes and she would always go to Sedona and you know do watercolors but she she was like very very supportive the plan was to go to art school um, I was looking at Cal Arts Otis San Francisco Art Institute and I think I just I I had this I don't know I, I had this realization that not a lot of people are just a painter you know sure. I have to do something in a business world and I didn't want to combine the two 
And so that's kind of when I started just naturally fell into acting and then producing and then ultimately directing. It's interesting. You mentioned, you know, your teacher, she's an artist, right? And she's teaching, but she's more into like landscapes and into the way that things are. And your Mm -hmm. films are not the way that things are. And I think that there's two different types of creators, right? You have a folk singer who writes a song about the way that the world is. And then you have someone who makes a slice of life film like Linklater. It's creation, of course, right? And there's imagination involved and there's story involved. But then you have genre creators, which you currently are very much in (laughs) that group. (laughs) And you're creating a, a world that does not exist. And that's really fascinating to me. It's, I don't want to say I don't like realistic stuff, but what is it about genre for you that has you've kind of gone down this route? Yeah, that's a that's an interesting thought. And and I and there's something for everyone. Like, you know, I'm kind of the same. I fall I you know, I go straight to the genre films every time. But there are films that are, you know, very real and in dramas that I love. I think that that world is real for me. I exist in a, and this is why I never felt felt like I fit in. I exist in a, a world of like, I don't know. I don't really take anything seriously. I think because it's just too much for me. So like, yeah. every, you know, I make a joke out of everything, um, which a lot of people don't like because, you know, they might be trying to say something serious. And, and I, of course, and that's my English sensibility of just taking, you know, <laughs> difficult situations and trying to make light of them through comedy. Yeah. I, I, I see the world in a lot of like colors and beauty, but there's a lot of darkness behind it. And there's a lot of sinister stuff at play. And of course, you know, in Unagi, it's something like she turns into a seal, a sea eel because she has irradiated sushi, which is taking like, it was inspired by Fukushima. And um, so it is taking like very real things and putting, I guess, my goggles on them of just like how absurd our world is. It's just, yeah. it's completely insane. It's actually more insane than the stuff that genre people make. You know, truth is stranger than fiction. <laughs> I, I, I agree with you 100%. What I always say is if you take an average person and you tell them what's going on in the news, they will say, oh, okay, okay, you know, that's, that's bad. Or they'll have a reaction to it. But if you show them a film where something bad happens, they will be more upset by that, that thing, which is completely fake. There, there is no real terror there at all. And they'll be offended that that has been put on the screen. And they're more offended than what's actually happening. Uh, you know, you just brought up Fukushima, how there should be like wailing in the streets over what has happened to this planet. But if you show someone a little horror short, they're like, well, I don't want to see that. And it's like there's this strange disconnect where we we've disconnected ourselves from reality and the box in front of us, the screen in front of us has become our reality so much that when that isn't pleasant, we can't we can't handle it. (laughs) We want we want the screen to be telling us nice things and making us feel good things. And and I think genre lovers, especially horror, agree with everything that you just said it's a reflection of what's happening in real life. And this, this is the version that you can handle, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Even though it's horrifying and terrifying and there's flashing lights and people transforming into uh, <laughs> monsters. Yeah. I actually, I had to stop after COVID. I had to stop watching the news because, you know, I do like most people, which is so sad in our generation suffer from anxiety. And mm-hmm. it's exactly because of this, we are fed just horrible information all day long. If we're not watching the news, it's coming up on our phone. If we're not looking at our phone, it's the conversation in the coffee shop and we can't escape it. And kids, like almost every kid I know suffers from anxiety or is on, is medicated for anxiety, yearning for the simpler times when things were really bad. Like there was world wars, but oh, yeah. it wasn't just, yeah, it wasn't just constantly being thrown in your face for a source of I mean, who knows what the, you know, money and all of that stuff. And I'm not going to sure, get into sure, a political sure, sure, sure. kind of conversation. <laughs> For me, like, I think a lot of people go to the movies to just be, like, entertained and escape and like, ah, oh, that was nice. I like leaving the movies 
feeling shocked and disturbed and disgusted and turned on and um, all these emotions that kind of, I don't know, in everyday life, I try and shelve because yeah. it's, it's overwhelming and it will give me a panic attack. And so when I go to a movie, unless it's like, you know, I'm on a plane and I want to watch something silly, which does happen occasionally. Sure, sure. I want to leave being like, oh my God, what did I just see? Yeah. That's why I think it's really important to try to push back against any form of censorship when it comes to, you know, the theater or film itself, because it's a safe place of imagination where we can communicate ideas. It's a pill, you know what I mean? Like it's not, it's not a, a little beaker of medicine that has an X on it because you have to be careful. It's a little pill that you can take one at a time <laughs> and yeah. you can sit with the information and it can do what it's supposed to do. And so whenever people are like, well, you know, I, I like movies, but I don't like X or I don't like Z. It's like, no, we have to remain open to be in this. I mean, for those of us who either are creating things or who find a lot of worth in that which is created, uh, we have to be open to everything. And it's real strange. I, I agree with you. Like you said, you know, people will say, oh, well, I like the good old days. And people will even say that with films now. They're like, well, the, the stuff that's coming out now, it's, it's nowhere good as, you know, the 80s or the 70s or the 60s. And it's like, hey, man, you know, if you go back and take any newspaper from 1975, sure, you'll have a great masterpiece, but you'll have 10 films that you and I have never heard of because all the crap just kind of goes away. <laughs> That's a great point. You had mentioned that you started out acting and you're, you've worked your way through to where now you are directing. And in a lot of the old shorts and in Wowzers, you are acting. And how do you feel about that? Like, do you feel like, okay, now I'm kind of, not that there's something wrong with acting, but for you personally, was that something that you did like out of necessity for your first shorts? Like, okay, I'm not going to pay someone or beg someone to do this. <laughs> I mean, you kind of hit the nail on the head. Yeah, it basically, I guess, kind of being a young woman who, you know, growing up in LA, it's like, I was kind of like geared in the direction of like, you're going to be an actress. Like you're put into this box of like, this is, you You look like an actor. So yeah. we're going to, you're going to be an actor. And, um, and I really loved acting because, you know, Again, as a character, I could, you know, shed some vulnerability that I'm not able to as myself. I just didn't like the, I didn't like the industry surrounding it. it you know, I didn't, it, it wasn't for me, but I knew that there was something mm. there that I loved. And so then I transitioned to producer because I'm like, okay, well, you know, like women aren't really directors and there are few and far between. And the ones that are, are amazing. And so, like, I'm not amazing, so I can't be a director, so I should be a producer. <laughs> As a woman, you can't be a bad anything, right? You either have to sit out or you have to be the best. So true. And then as a producer, I kind of found, I'm like, okay, like, I, you know, there's aspects of this I love. It's not for me. And then, so I would, I, I started directing. I'm like, let me try this because I think that this might be where, I think this might be my path. And I'm like, of course, I cannot I'm the type of person that like when I come to set, I know every single shot. I have lookbooks for every single department. I am so terrified of being embarrassing myself, letting myself down, letting sure. my crew down. But I, I become so overly prepared and I do I do compromise on set. You have to. But I wanna know that that there's the possibility of getting the idea I've prepped and planned for. And um, I couldn't let anyone see me not know what I was doing until I started to learn what I was doing. And so that's why I kind of started doing every single bit and especially the acting. And um, I didn't want to tell an actor to do what I thought that they should do or, you know, give them directions because I didn't have confidence. Yeah, I, it's interesting. I've kind of found, you know, the two major things for me that I did love, like, you know, acting, actors, and visual painting, colors, storytelling through visuals, blending them together, it's, that is directing. And so it kind of just became 
like the obvious choice. So I still get to work with actors. I still get to work on material. And then I also get to do that craftsmanship of like creating the book, which to me is just, it's like the most exciting thing in the world. So I want to ask you something, but I'm nervous that I have kind of created this in my mind, but it feels like it, it just feels like there's no way it can't be a real thing. I have to ask you about putting the kettle on. (laughs) So, (laughs) so once I noticed this, I didn't go back to confirm that it's in like everything in all of your films, but this is a thing, right? (laughs) <laughs> it's an Easter egg. No, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so glad to keep up on that. No one else has ever mentioned it. Um, oh, really? Oh, man. Okay, yeah. cool. All right. Yeah, and I, it will probably be in every one of my films. And basically, oh, you the should. First, you totally should. Yeah. <laughs> the first um, draft of Fucking Nuts at the very end, it goes to black, and you hear the kettle boiling, and uh, the mother asks if anyone wants tea. So, I, like I said, I grew up, uh, my mom and, and grandma and sister all were English. And so I was very much, and they're the main people that I surrounded myself with, um, grew up in a very much so English household of, you know, we didn't drink coffee, we drank cups of tea with milk and sugar. And, you know, we had eggs and soldiers for breakfast and beans on toast and all of those things. And then after that, I was with a, um, I dated a British man for 13 years. And I've just noticed that uh, over the course of my life, which has been informed by the Brits, anytime something bad happens, Mm. it's like, oh, let's put the kettle on. Right. And that makes everything okay. It is so crazy how it works. But like my dad passed away 12 years ago. And I remember my, my boyfriend at the time didn't know what to say to me, but he said, I'll put the kettle on. And instantly Mm. I was like soothed. And it's just, it goes back into the, you know, the times of all the wars and, and how tea was that one thing that like brought everyone together. It warmed them, it soothed them, it calmed them. And it's just, I don't know if it's a psychosomatic or um, <laughs> melancholic, but there's something about, you know, in, a, in one of my films when shit gets crazy there's always got to be the someone that's just trying to like put the kettle on right. and make everything right in the upside down world that they live in. All right. I'm glad I brought it up then because <laughs> <laughs> after like the third or fourth one, I was like, there's no way there's too much because there's too much intention behind what you're doing. Um, something else that I had said when we were emailing back and forth was in fucking nuts. It's like, you know, I'm not a fan of hyperbole and also I have no reason to, um, you know, like suck up to you. So when I say this, I hope, you know, I'm telling the truth. It's almost like a masterclass in how to include a ton of different shots in a short period of time without it feeling like a science project or like a math formula, you know, like I just noticed, um, I don't know who your DP was on that. I, I should have, written that down but it's it's so great and there's so much intention behind everything that i was like there's no way this isn't on on purpose (laughs) well i do i do want to hear what your what your takeaway was and what maybe you thought you made of it but i do want to just give a real quick shout out to daniel waghorn who's the dp who it's it's crazy uh meeting him was like meeting my creative counterpart um Mm. He was in New Orleans and Joe Badon, who I brought on to creative produce, he kind of came as a package deal. And instantly when we were kind of working together on Zooms, I could see that he was as equally obsessed and crazy about the process as me. You know, I am to a fault where like, I don't, for months in advance before I shoot, I don't sleep. I literally, I die after (laughs) my shoot. Because I put so much into it and I obsess and I'm like, how can I make this better? What can I do? And he was very much like that. And so he would get so excited. We would have these Zooms and we're like, okay, so I want to do this shot. You know, I wanted to do, oh, the shot where, where um, Dan sees the, meets the parents and yeah. there's this amazing camera rig that's on him. And I kind of told him what I wanted for the shot. 
literally two days later, he's like, so I got this thing. It's called a Snorri rig. I bought it on Amazon. You just attach it here. And like, it moves with you. And, um, you know, it's great for like, if you're trying to look in two different directions, the camera moves with you. And he showed me like a test shot of it. And I was like, absolutely. I love this. Yes. And, um, you know, the overhead bed shot of her on the phone spinning. I was like, look, I feel like this is going to be, I wrote this a long time ago and I was like, it's going to be too expensive. It's going to be too hard to shoot for such a silly idea. Mm -hmm. When I kind of, I was like, I don't know how we can do this shot, but I want to do this shot. And he's like, oh, easy. We'll build this rig. And he like literally built the rig and showed me a test shot. I'm like, I love you. (laughs) And um, we stayed at an Airbnb together as we were shooting. And like, we would both sleep maybe three hours. Our yeah. shoots were night shoots. And from like 11 a.m. to when we had to go to set at like 3 p.m., we sat together with the shot list and talked about the shots. And we're like, okay, you know, we're going to have to cut some stuff. We're going to have to combine some stuff. We're going to have to maybe make this a little different. I don't know. It was like going into battle with like the best asset that you could possibly have. Yeah. So kudos to him. But I want to hear what your interpretation of the tea kettle is. Did you actually create a story behind it or? Well, so it's interesting because in my, I think my favorite of the early stuff was the lag. Um, <laughs> okay. That was the first thing I ever made. <laughs> really? That, that I, well, wowzers. Yeah. That was actually the first thing I ever made. I was um, going to a summer program at RADA in London for acting, mm-hmm. um, studying Shakespeare and I wasn't sleeping and I was literally losing my mind. Mm. And I said to my, I would like at three in the morning, I would make little shorts of just me in my room, losing my mind. And I said to my like dorm, dorm classmates, I'm like, will you help me make my first movie? And that's the lag. So I love that you like that. Yeah, it was cool. You know, I, I think on Vimeo, the, maybe the thumbnail, is the the white bathroom with the blood and it reminded me of a specific shot from Scorsese's uh the the big shave I don't know if you've seen that's one of his oh, really early no but I am aware, aware of that film incredibly violent <laughs> <laughs> where a dude basically like shaves his own face off but Ooh. um yeah and so it was interesting because in that one she says oh I'm gonna go put the kettle on as a way of like doing what you said it does in like helping to like calm that person, but in like a sinister way. (laughs) Yeah. But yeah, I loved it. I thought it was great. You know, that whole thing of like, do you want to see my laser? Right. (laughs) That is such, there are such strange little things in genre films where when you say it, when you take it out of context, it doesn't make any sense. But when it's in the context of the whole, it feels like, okay, this makes sense. And it feels really sinister and strange. And it it just felt, it felt pretty unique. So I, yeah, I had no Uh, idea that was the first one that you had done. So good job. Yeah. Um, I basically, I, I kind of started, I, I, at age 19, I was like, I'm a raver and I would like go to these warehouse parties and dance all night to amazing house and disco music and you know, it was always entranced by, because I love light so much, entranced by the sure. lasers. And, um, you know, they definitely had a impact on my brain. And so when I knew I was going to RADA and I'd have to be staying in this dorm, which was not cute at all, I'm like, I'm going to get my own laser so that when I'm done with class, I can turn on my laser and I can maybe like make a cup of tea and put a little scotch in there and put some music on and just like get, have my own party. Sure, because sure. I'm working really hard. And there is a thing too, where like I now have so many lasers and I sometimes do like laser light shows for people's parties, but like people will come over and I'd be like, Hey, can I show you my laser? <laughs> and, um, and I don't know, there's something just so creepy about it because it sounds like you're like, what, what does that right. even mean? It's like some sexual innuendo. It's like, no, I have this really cool laser. Like, let me show right. you. Like, it's a star right. projector. How cool is that? And many times people, like, are a little – they don't have the reaction I was hoping they'd have. 
Like I want them to instantly be like, wow, this is so cool. Right. Like <laughs> another one on. And they're sure. just a little bit like, I, I, I don't know, I guess unnerved. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it made its way into the script. <laughs> it's cool too. Cause it's so specific. Like it's not, uh, do you want to see my light or do you want to see something? <laughs> it's, do you want to see my laser? <laughs> it's so specific. <laughs> <laughs> and the it's, reason yeah. why she chose the laser and like I didn't know how to say circadian I think is how you pronounce it or me I don't know oh, I pronounce it wrong yes, yeah yes. I pronounce it wrong yeah. um which I'm gonna say I did that on purpose um, you know <laughs> I, I'm I'm a big fan we just did on the show we did this uh we covered this film called Miami Connection I'm not sure if you're familiar with it it was it's one of the no. movies uh, it's right up there with like the room or troll Two of like the best bad movies Ooh. ever made. And for me growing up, I grew up, um, really heavy into like DIY punk music. And so mm-hmm. anything made by hand or made without caring so much about what the outcome is, it's just making something that is always like very near and dear to my heart. So whenever there's something like that, like a word is mispronounced or, Maybe you see the boom a little bit. <laughs> I'm just like, I love it. I, I don't look at those things and think like, ah, oh, well, they don't know what they're doing. I just think someone is making some, like a human being made this. This wasn't filtered through so many studios and so many algorithms. And you know what I mean? Right. Like someone just made this. And so I, I thought it was, I thought it was charming. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. If you had an AI, AI writer, you'd have to be like, and I want you to, Make it sound like I'm a human and have errors. Right, 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 um, right, right. So, fucking nuts is premiering soon, right? Um, this we've we've announced this one. So, La Tronge in Paris it premieres on the fifth, okay. which is very exciting because my two step brothers live in Paris. Yeah. Um, the incredible artist that did the score, which I am so in love with the score. Um, their group is Scratch Massive, and it's Sebastian and Mod is his partner. They're going to be in Paris. Um, so they're going, my incredible gaffer who's done the last three things I've worked on and will do everything I work on Tom. Um, he's in Paris right now. He's French. Um, I think the guy that made the poster is going to be there. He's French as well. Um, so it's going to be a cool little party. Uh, and I'm going of course, cause it's the premiere and this awesome. festival's awesome. And there's some great, I was looking today at their lineup and like Yodorowsky is on it. Um, awesome. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, okay, is he coming? He's coming. <laughs> and he is coming because he's teaching a workshop. Awesome. And then there's others, which, so um, the others that have announced are New Orleans and Sydney Underground. And then Fantastic Fest, which is like the biggest honor ever, announces tomorrow. Motel X in Lisbon, which I'll be going to. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I'm getting like into great like festivals I really, really wanted to get into. So it's paying off. Awesome. So I'm also a person with anxiety, as you had uh, mentioned. So f- for right now, you know, you're going to be doing this circuit and, you know, it's great. It's a great accomplishment that you guys made it and finished it. How much in your mind are you thinking about like what's next or are you just, are you, are you able to not think about what's next? (laughs) (laughs) As far as um, like next project. Yeah. I have a terrible problem of, I can't even, you know, reap the benefits of this because I'm like, well, I haven't done something like this month, you know, I haven't made my next film and people are going to, you know, they've already seen this one and, they're going to be like, well, she's like old news. It's yep. my poor brain. It's, it's very exhausting being inside my head. So yes, I'm continuously thinking of what's next. And I have to make a feature. I, I don't think I would do another short in a second if someone asked me or if someone gave me money, but I cannot take out any more of my down payment for a house, which I hope to own one day Sure. to make a short <laughs> film. And because of my, um, because of how I've progressed as, you know, a storyteller, my projects have gotten more expensive and um, I don't think I can do the cheap little, you know, zero dollar budget. You know, there's something wrong with mommy anymore. I mean, I could, but like, 
for me, that's not fulfilling. So I have, I have two concepts. I have a concept for a fucking nuts feature, which I originally didn't, but I was thinking like, oh, if I'm touring this film, I should have one. And that I really want it to be a like rock opera, um, oh, kind of a, yeah, like a Brazil meets all that jazz about a, you know, a young girl who suffers from PTSD from her, you know, childhood and her upbringing. And she's created this false world which she lives in where like everything is kind of a, a bit of a, a joke or an, a pun or entertaining. And, oh, that's um, awesome. <laughs> yeah. It's a bit of a, it's a bit of a love story um, of this boy who, you know, wants to join her in this world, but the parents who want to, you know, they want her to be normal. And um, it was inspired by that, the great uncle that I mentioned before, who is an artist he had, he's passed away, but he had a mental break, a schizophrenic break, and kind of disappeared off the radar for about six months. And when he came back, he wrote a letter to us saying like, I've just had the most wonderful time. I've been riding mm. unicorns on rainbows and it's been absolutely wow. lovely. And I was like, oh my God, we've all been like, poor uncle Peter has gone insane. Like we got to lock him up and put him in a mental hospital. And He's literally having the best time of his life, right. you know, doing what I dream of doing. Love to ride right. a unicorn on a rainbow. And um, the concept kind of interests me of like, you know, we really do try and our discomfort around things like mental illness and addiction and, you know, other people's behavior. It causes us to try and change that to make us feel not more, us feel more comfortable, not the person who's experiencing it. And, um, so I kind of wanted to explore that, um, with the, with a fucking nuts feature. And I've always wanted to make a, like a rock opera musical. Um, and so that, <laughs> but that's going to cost a lot because it's going to have insane production design and choreography. And then, um, the feature, which I'm looking for a co-writer, um, I have a full treatment. I have a full deck. I have financiers that are interested in it but um, I'm not a screenplay writer. It's about kind of about my struggle as an artist and, you know, kind of trying to build a career in a world where being a woman, you never really know uh, who actually believes in you, who, you know, sorry, I'm going to be blatant, who wants to sleep with you. Um, it's a real thing. Sure. It happens. Sure. You don't know people's intention and it's really hard to trust people. And I just have, so much distrust in it. It makes me sad because there are certain people that actually do want to help me and believe in me. Right. And, um, and I wish I could tell the difference, but, um, she's a, basically it's about a new Orleans street artist who kind of gets indoctrinated into this occult group. She doesn't realize that they're occultists, but kind of the, the leader of the group specifically needs to redeem his, his status because he's older you know, and um, he's not as on trend as he used to be. And he sees something in this woman and he kind of takes her under his wing to be his muse and she, his muse, etc. It's kind of my Rosemary's baby if Rosemary had revenge and wasn't a victim. Oh, okay. Yeah. And it's a story about her and it's based off of some very interesting real people and that I'm pushing hard because I'm I'm ready to go. If you give me yeah. a script and some money, I would go. I'm ready for it. So that's called Babylon Ascending. Awesome. Yeah. If any of y'all listening are great <laughs> with um, <laughs> character-driven thrillers, hit me up. So where can people find you and where can people find your stuff? Yes, the plug. Uh, social media that I use is pretty much only Instagram. And my, my handle is... The other Sam Fox and then, or the film production company is Sam Foxy Films. And then I have a website, samfoxyfilms.com. I respond and see everything. So don't be afraid. So hit her up. <laughs> yeah, don't be afraid. Don't be a stranger. Well, hey, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, this was a lot of fun. And like I said, I really liked everything that I've seen so far and uh, the two pitches that I heard I'm totally into. So uh, I look forward to whatever comes next and uh, we'll be sure to cover it here on the show. Thank you so much. It was a really, really great interview. Thank you. I appreciate 
all your kindness and questions and thoughtful, insightful compliments. So you will absolutely be hearing more from me and I will be in New York in October for something. So cool. we'll let you know if you want to come down to the city. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Sam. Have a good one. Thank you so much. Sam's new short, Fucking Nuts, is making its way around festivals this fall. Give her a follow on Instagram, and like she said, don't be a stranger. Thanks for listening. Have a good one. Movie Friends is produced by Seth Vargas and Michelle Rubenstein. Music by Anthony Vicora. If you like the show, please subscribe and give us a rating. It really helps us find new friends. Thanks.